Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we're not doing another reading in New Vrindavan. Yeah. It would have been lovely to do a reading every day, but we were just genuinely so, so busy. busy. My God. So busy. Um, and uh, so now we're in the airport on our way to Alachua, Pittsburgh Airport. But we're going to do a reading. So here we go. We're at the airport, by the way. Sun is coming up behind us and probably see why he's taking off. Okay, so it's Canto 3, Chapter 33, Text 15. The home and household paraphernalia of Kardama, who was one of the Prajapatis, Prajapatis, was developed in such a way by dint of his mystic powers of austerity and yoga that his opulence was sometimes envied by those who travel in outer space in airplanes. Proper. The statement in this verse that Kaiba Muni's household affairs were envied even by persons who travel in outer space refers to the denizens of heaven. Their airships are not like those we have invented in the modern age, which fly only from one country to another. Their airplanes were capable of going from one planet to another. There are many such statements in the Srimad Bhagavatam, from which we can understand that there were facilities to travel from one planet to another, especially in the higher planetary system. And who can say that they are not still traveling? The speed of our airplanes and space vehicles is very limited. But as we have already studied, Kaiba Muni travelled in outer space in an airplane which was like a city and he journeyed to see all the different heavenly planets. That was not an ordinary airplane, nor was it ordinary space travel. Because Kaiba Muni was such a powerful mystic yogi, his opulence was envied by the denizens of heaven. This is an appropriate verse and proper, seeing as we're at the airport and we're about to get on an in, internal flight. It's going to be a very small, squishy um, aeroplane. Yeah, unfortunately I don't have such mystic yoga powers that I can create a flying palace for us to That's a shame. travel around. Yeah, maybe a future birth. Well, I don't want to come back anyway to the material world. Okay, good. So we'll just go back to the spiritual world and fly on this one. Mm. Whatever they fly on. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think people that would read this, say who are not accepting the philosophy, would be like, well, that's just, you know, science fiction or but especially because this refers to an age of time many millions of years ago. So we can see how advanced civilization was. And we can see, um, and also in other planets, as Prabhupada is referring to here, you know, we're just scraping back, you know, looking at Mars from a distance or looking at Venus or whatever. But, yeah the moon as Prabhupada said in rocks from the moon so we can see actually that there are other planets that have people living on it sophisticated and they can travel very nicely and easily with these sophisticated high-tech airplanes not like the little dingy one we're gonna get on. Uh, yeah so yeah I guess the point being that there is definitely a lot of talk in the world and when I was growing up all about UFOs and things like that and the Bhagavatam just kind of confirms that yeah of course there are, there are vehicles that fly around in space and fly from one planet to the other there are other beings of course the pictures and descriptions that you see of these other beings oftentimes they don't look uh, very heavenly but what here you mean? No, like often they show pictures of bald alien. Oh know, yeah, alien here you mean in this plant like Roswell. Okay, yeah, well whatever they show pictures. Area fifty one. Yeah. Like 
she knows. says like she's like some expert. I th I'm the okay. Anyway. It's true that we are aliens. We're all aliens in this world because we're spiritual beings. We belong in the spiritual sky, not on this this planet. Text 16. The opulence of the household of Cardamom when is described herein, the bed sheets and mattresses were all as white as the foam of milk. <laughs> the chairs and benches were made of ivory and were covered by cloths of lace with golden filigree, and the couches were made of gold and had very soft pillows. <coughs> so here we have another example of uh, a great personality, a great devotee. Um, God became his son. And he was living in so much opulence. Of course, he was living under great austerity for many years and went back to that at the end. Mm. But, um, but yeah, just see, his, his opulence was the envy of the demigods. Hmm. The walls of the house were made of first-class marble, decorated with valuable jewels. There was need, no need of light, for the household was illuminated by the rays of these jewels. The female members of the household were all amply decorated with jewelry. So it wasn't just uh, Devahuti, because um, she had, what, I forget, like a hundred or a thousand maid servants. It's a bit Her much. Point. Well, you know. Purport is understood from this statement that the opulences of household life were exhibited in valuable jewels, ivory, first class marble, and furniture made of gold and jewels. The clothes are also mentioned as being decorated with gold and filigree. Everything actually had some value. It was not like the furniture of the present day, which is cast in valueless plastic or base metal. The way of Vedic civilization is that whatever was used in household affairs had to be valuable. In case of need, such items of value could be exchanged immediately. Thus, one's broken and unwanted furniture and paraphernalia would never be without value. This system is still followed by Indians in household affairs. They keep metal utensils and golden ornaments or silver plates and valuable silk garments with gold embroidery and in case of need they can have some money in exchange immediately. Interesting concept. There are exchanges for the money lenders and the householders. Now that's, I think that's brilliant. I mean, basically what, um, you know, because what happens to all the useless stuff it just gets thrown in the pen, contaminates and pollutes the world. Um, the process for making and creating it is contaminating. And then it's just junk anyway and doesn't get used. But of course, in the modern day, to have, you know, pillars of marble cast with jewels and, you know, gold plates and things like that is... Um, yeah, it's so opulent, people can't even afford it, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we see in previous ages mm -hmm. that people were able to afford such things, so, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I like this, you know, even in the modern day in India, and it's true, you see, ladies wear silk, silk uh, saris, mm -hmm. um, of course, I don't know how many of them they can sell the saris after they've worn it for some time, but... You know, the utensils and have silver plates, at least now, especially for the deities, you may have these things. So, anyway, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant concept and understanding. Okay. Verse 18. The compound of the main household was surrounded by beautiful gardens with sweet fragrant flowers and many trees which produced fresh fruit and were tall and beautiful. The attraction of such gardens was that singing birds would sit on the trees and their chanting voices as well as the humming sound of the bees made the whole atmosphere as pleasing as possible. So it sounds very heavenly. Verse 19, but when Devahuti would enter that lovely garden to take her bath in the pond filled with lotus flowers, the associates of the denizens of heaven, the Gandavas would sing about Kadma's glorious household life. 
Her great husband, Kaidama, gave her all protection at all times. So I'm not sure about this. It's like if I go to have a bath, I want to go in private. And I don't need people singing or looking and what is she doing, you know? Well, now this is an important point because actually the fact is, and I remember when I first joined this con and you know, I was taught that when you go to the toilet or go for a shower, you should always wear a gumsha. And the reason being was that um, one with higher knowledge and higher understanding knows that the demigods are always watching, especially the devotees. So they're always seeing how they're acting and conducting themselves. So one would cover oneself um, and not be naked at any time. Oh, so, the demigods are always watching. There's I mean, no I, need I to always watch, thank you. Huh? There's no need to always watch, thank you. Will you tell that to the demigods? That's what I'm talking to. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm talking to you. I'm, like, I'm the only one here, and I'm just talking to some of the other people. No, the demigods over there. Oh, okay. okay, the poor part. The ideal husband and wife relationship is very nicely described in this statement. Kaido Amuni gave Devahuti all sorts of comforts in his duty as a husband, but he was not at all attached to his wife. As soon as his son Kapila Dev was grown up, Kaido at once left all family connection. Similarly, Devahuti was the daughter of the great king, Zwayam Bhuvamadu, and was qualified and beautiful. But she was completely dependent on the protection of her husband. According to Manu, women, the fair sex, should not have this at any stage of life. In childhood, a woman must be under the protection of the parents. In youth, she must be under the protection of her husband. And in old age, she must be under the protection of the grown men. Devahudi demonstrated all these statements of the Manu Samhita in her life. As a child, she was dependent on her father. Later, she was dependent on her husband, in spite of her opulence, and she was later on dependent on her son, Kapila Dev. Hmm. I think it's true. It doesn't happen so much in the modern day. It Maybe doesn't. amongst some pious or, um, I would say, pious or religious or uh, cultured families, yes. Mm, happened in my family. Mm. Still does. Yeah, I mean, you, you still, you lived at home under the protection of your father till we got married and that mm. was, you know, what age, I'm not say? sure, yeah, why would I say that? <laughs> So, We're yeah. talking about David Hooty here. Yeah, but the principle of, I mean, of yeah. course, I think we've already discussed this. Maybe it was with Jagamohini Mataji mm -hmm. that, um, mm -hmm. that, yeah, in general, the the ladies want to be independent. They don't want to be under anyone's protection, and uh, to even suggest that is a sort of um, infringement of their their rights and their freedom. And therefore, you know, they don't want to hear anything about it. It's discriminative. It's sexist. It's you know, which okay, yeah. I mean, from that from that perspective, I can see it. I can understand. But from the perspective of giving shelter and giving protection to the fairer sex, to uh, someone who could be theoretically easily exploited. And, and Prabhupada talked about this quite a lot, actually, just from the perspective that you, you want your freedom, but then you become dependent on the government um, because you become a single, single mom or you, know, you have children out of wedlock. And, and, um, and I know someone was saying the other day that you know, Prabhupada's comment about this and that having children out of wedlock and single moms are a burden on society. They were saying that this is very heavy and very cruel because they were a single mom. And it's not, it's, you know, you have to get past the, the fact, you know, of judgment because Krishna still accepts us. But the point being that actually in a cultured society that, that wouldn't be going on, you know. Um, that, you know, and we see in society, if we're honest, that 
many, a lot of times, you know, children aren't wanted. They're just the byproducts of sense gratification. They grow up not feeling love, not feeling shelter, not feeling supported. And then they themselves either go on to create the same situation in the next generation, or they turn to crime. I mean, there may be cases, of course, where some of them turn out to be exceptional persons. But I think the general principle is there that for a healthy, happy jiva to grow up, there should be a, a, a strong household uh, of maturity and culture. That's certainly not, not always the case these days, that's for sure. Any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, agree. Okay, so maybe we'll conclude here. Our flight will be leaving soon. Okay. And uh, maybe yeah. our next check-in will be from Alachua. Um, Iskan uh, Raman Reti, I think. In is, Orlando. Uh, well, it's not in Orlando, it's in Alachua, uh, which is near Gainesville. In Florida. In Florida, yeah. We're flying into Orlando. Okay, so you can check Bhakti Vision. I'm sure there'll be a Bhakti Vision set up for... Uh, it should be, yeah. They will be. be. They will be. Okay, Hare Krishna, everyone. Please read the Srimad Bhagavatam. Read together, read out loud, discuss, converse, and uh, take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna, in this form of Srimad Bhagavatam. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.